Good evening and welcome to the April 2023 AIA Archaeology Hour. My name is Ken Seligson and I'm the president of the Los Angeles County Society of the AIA, as well as an assistant professor of anthropology at California State University Dominguez Hills here in Los Angeles. I research ancient human environmental relationships in the northern Maya lowlands of Yucatan, Mexico. The AIA LA is excited to have the honor of hosting the final Archaeology Hour of Spring 2023. Just a quick note, this lecture is a live presentation that is being recorded by the AIA. Recording by attendees is strictly prohibited. The AIA respects the intellectual property of its presenters and asks that viewers do the same. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Sorry. <laughs> Before introducing this evening's speaker, Dr. Sarah Gonzalez, I would like to share that here in Los Angeles, we've been celebrating our 119th anniversary of the AIA LA with a full year of virtual and in-person talks spanning topics around the globe from ancient Greece to St. Croix to the Maya lowlands. And our Getty Museum liaisons have led members only private tours of the exhibitions about Assyria, Nubia, and the Codice Maya de Mexico. We were very lucky to have several of our members publish books in the past year, and their virtual book talks are all now available on our AIA LA YouTube channel, so check them out. With so many local institutions of higher learning, we put a big effort into supporting students interested in archaeology. Every year, we offer two undergraduate scholarships to help students have their first fieldwork experience and are hoping to make graduate student scholarships available soon as well. I also wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the amazing work of our public education liaison, Dr. Dawn Cox, whose middle school archaeology club has been very active. She was awarded a fellowship that will allow her to bring six K through 12 educators and six high school students to Greece this summer. Thank you for all the opportunities you're providing for students to get involved with archaeology early on, Dawn. Our next society talk will be delivered virtually by Dr. Sarah Clayton of the University of Wisconsin-Madison on Tuesday, May 9th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time about the end of Teotihuacan. You can find the Zoom link for Dr. Clayton's talk on our society website, aia-la.org, and you can also follow us on any of our social media channels. I would like to encourage anyone tuning in who might not yet be a member of the AIA to please check out the AIA website and consider joining. Membership of the AIA provides access to amazing lecture series like this one at the national and local levels, both virtually and in person, archeological fellowships and scholarships, member travel deals, and perhaps most importantly, a subscription to Archeology span Magazine. Making the most of the new Zoom world, the AIA has offered a wide range of excellent virtual lectures this year. No worries if you miss them because they're all now available on the AIA YouTube channel. But enough of me rambling. Now on to the reason why you are all tuning in. I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sarah Gonzalez, who is an associate professor of anthropology and an adjunct assistant professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. Dr. Gonzalez works at the intersection of tribal historic preservation, indigenous studies, and public history. Her research specifically examines how community-based participatory approaches to research improve the empirical and interpretive quality of archeological narratives, while also situating archeology span within a more respectful and engaged practice. This involves exploring the diverse applications of minimally invasive field methods and digital media as tools for contributing to the capacity of tribal communities to manage their historic and environmental resources. Centered on her ongoing collaboration with tribal communities in California, Oregon, and Washington, Gonzalez has developed multiple classroom, lab, and field school programs that provide undergraduate and graduate students with the opportunity to participate directly in research with tribal communities that contributes to their capacity to study, manage, and represent their heritage. She has co-authored numerous journal articles and in 2018 co-authored co -authored the book, The Archaeology of Matini Village, an archaeological study of sustained colonialism. She is also an editor for the forthcoming publication, Routledge Handbook of the Archaeology of Indigenous Colonial Interaction in the Americas. 
If you are interested in learning more from Dr. Gonzalez about her research after this evening's lecture, then you're in luck. She'll be giving an AIA Archaeology Abridged talk entitled The Science of Storytelling on Thursday, April 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. We are now ready for the main event, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Ken. I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the shared lands and waters of the federally recognized Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations and unrecognized Duwamish tribe. I also want to give thanks to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and their Historic Preservation Office for granting me the privilege of living on and coming to know their lands and heritage these past nine years. As a Chaconic scholar, I'm committed to creating space for these and other Indigenous peoples through my mentorship, teaching, service, and research in and outside of the Academy. This evening, I'm going to be speaking about how this commitment is realized through field methods in Indigenous archaeology. The community-based research and training program I've developed alongside the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office, or HPO. This project and my research more broadly examines the challenges and opportunities for creating indigenous archaeologies, what I define as sovereignty driven approaches to studying, caring for, and representing the past that are conducted with, for, and by indigenous peoples. Now, these approaches share three broad characteristics. First, they recognize the fundamental sovereign right of indigenous nations and communities to care for their homelands and heritage. Second, they integrate community-specific protocols and methods for working with tribal heritage. And finally, they feature the equitable and direct participation of Indigenous peoples in archaeology. Understanding the commitments of Indigenous archaeologies and the projects they inspire, however, requires an understanding of the context in which Indigenous heritage is managed within settler states. In North America, the relations of archaeological practice are artifacts of settler colonialism. That is, the historically asymmetrical relations between the state and indigenous nations are replicated within the legal and disciplinary frameworks that guide how we study the past and who has the right to do so. For example, U.S. heritage laws charge archaeologists with legal stewardship over the archaeological record. This authority is predicated on the systematic occupation and dispossession of indigenous peoples from their homelands. Put simply, that indigenous peoples no longer reside in place provides the premise for the states and its agents, in this case, archeologists, continued claim to indigenous lands. The enactment of these laws in turn further cements these settler claims by vigorously denying and thus erasing indigenous sovereignty in the present. As an archaeologist who works in community-based partnership with tribal nations, my research and service within the field answers the question of, how might we begin to reckon with these colonial relations, and importantly, the historical and ongoing legacies that they inspire? Drawing on my experience indigenizing archaeology with the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office, or HPO, I'll begin to outline how our project, Field Methods in Indigenous Archaeology, begins to answer this question by unsettling the colonial relations of the discipline, by creating justice in the process of knowledge production. To make this case, I'll examine three key aspects of our work together. First, how the community-based research framework of FMIA creates a grand round way for studying the past, one that supports tribal sovereignty and self-determination. Second, how this approach changes the methods we use on the ground to work with grand round heritage. And finally, the impact that this approach has on how we use archaeology as a tool to collectively remember grand round survivance. In so doing, indigenous archeologies like FMIA offer a powerful example of what we stand to gain from the methods we use on the ground to the stories we tell when we move indigenous perspectives from the margins to the mainstream. But before I address these core questions, I'd like to introduce you a little bit more to the Grand Ronde Nation and its historic preservation office. The HPO is charged with the authority to advocate for and manage the nation's heritage. <clears throat> 
But what does this mean within the context of a tribe's history and the nation it, of the tribe's history and the nation that it represents? <clears throat> The federally recognized nation is comprised of the descendants from over 30 individual bands and tribes from across Western Oregon, including Umpqua, Malala, Rogue Ro River, Kalapuya, and Chasta peoples. Following two rounds of treaty making with the US government, these communities were officially removed from their homelands in Western Oregon and forcibly settled onto a 61,000 acre reservation west of Salem in the winter of 1856 to 1857. Subsequent to repeated land grabs that reduced lands held in trust to only 510 acres, on August 13, 1954, Congress passed the Western Oregon Termination Act, which stripped the nation of its status as an official Indian tribe until the tribe was restored in 1983 after decades of advocacy. It would take until 1988 for Congress to reestablish a 9,000 acre reservation. Today, the Historic Preservation Office is directly responsible for managing over 14,000 acres of reservation and trust lands, and their oversight extends over the Confederated Tribes' usual and accustomed territories in Western Oregon, which constitute approximately a quarter of the state's lands in which over 50% of the state's population currently resides. In the past year alone, the HPO and its staff of seven reviewed over 7,000 notices pertaining to federal undertakings. And responding to these notices is but a small component of the office's total responsibilities, which also include coordinating repatriation, managing collections and archives, and supporting cultural programming within the community. And I mention these details because it highlights the significant capacity related challenges the nation faces in carrying out the duties of historic preservation on and off reservation. It also contextualizes why they invited me and my then graduate student, now Dr. Ian Kretzler, to visit with the Historic Preservation Office at Chachalu, the Tribal Museum in May 2014 to discuss the potential of working together. This invitation didn't come out of thin air. I've known members of the HPO since 2010, and they were very familiar with my work with other tribal historic preservation offices in California, including the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians and the Amamutsun Band of Ohlone Indians. And I've mentioned these things here to highlight the importance of long-term relationships and the kind of research that I'm discussing this evening. What emerged from that conversation was field methods in indigenous archaeology, which I've now co-directed with the Historic Preservation Office for the past nine years. There's three interrelated capacity building goals of this overarching project. First, the development of a low impact archaeological and historic preservation plan that prescribes where and how to use archaeology as a tool of heritage management on the reservation. Second, the initiation of field, archival, and ethnographic research that assists with the remembering and witnessing of Grand Ronde's survivance, that is understanding how the tribal nation became and continues to be a thriving community, even while contending with the dispossession of and dislocation from their homelands. And finally, creating a community-based field school that offers training in tribal historic preservation to undergraduate and graduate students and which serves as a primary context for undertaking the first two projects that I mentioned. While I'd love to provide a deeper dive into each of these projects for our purposes this evening, I'm going to focus my comments on the first two capacity-related goals as they encapsulate what I see as the methodological, interpretive, and relational outcomes of doing archaeology in a grand rond way. Before I detail how field methods in Indigenous archaeology creates a sovereignty-based historic preservation plan with Grand Ron, I want to return to a point that I made at the outset of my talk, that heritage regulations in the U.S. replicate the relations of settler colonialism. While amendments to the National Historic Preservation Act in 1992 created a pathway for tribal nations to assume the duties of historic preservation on reservation lands, and also mandated government-to-government -government consultation for federal undertakings, the relations between the state and indigenous nations remains asymmetrical. Failure to engage in tribal consultation beyond mere notification is a common issue that tribal historic preservation officer, officers document. 
and recent cases such as the Dakota Access Pipeline or the construction of the border wall under Trump's Department of the Interior also demonstrate how federal agencies and their partners often fail to integrate the recommendations of tribal nations from mandated consultation into mitigation plans. While these issues are variably represented based on local contexts, for example, the depth of meaningful relations established between individual or collective tribal historic preservation offices and federal or state agencies, it remains that the regulatory framework itself was not designed with references to the interests or needs of tribal nations. This creates additional challenges in that what counts as a significant cultural resource under the law and thus what warrants our protection or which methods are used to manage these resources are more often than not based on Western science and archeological standards and not those of tribes. The Grand Run HPO responds to these structural limitations by pursuing what it calls meaningful consultation with the agencies and heritage managers within its ancestral and ceded territories. Now, meaningful consultation goes beyond federal guidelines and consists of the building of long-term personal relationships, which the HPO views as a crucial opportunity for expanding the community of those personally invested in the care and protection of Grand Ronde heritage. In this sense, cultivating relationships is a pathway for creating epistemic bridges. That is, they open up the necessary space for heritage managers to come to see and evaluate tribal heritage from a uniquely Grand Ronde perspective. Grand Ron also articulates a sovereignty-based approach to historic preservation by changing the language that state and federally, federal agencies use to characterize what are typically referred to in these settings as tribal cultural resources or tribal cultural landscapes. Internally, the language the HPO uses further reflects the values of the nation. For example, they supplant terms like artifacts with belongings to assert the responsibility involved in continued ownership over their tangible heritage. And they use the Chinook Wawa concept of econom in lieu of myth or oral history to refer to their collective histories from time immemorial to the present. Econom are communicated in place and through people's practices, and you can see examples of this within the story of South Wind, an ArcGIS story map that the tribe produced, I believe in 2008, and I can provide a link to it after the talk is done. And together, these vocabulary shifts are designed to center Grand Ronde knowledge, and specifically the interconnected web of human and non-human relationships that created and which continue to sustain the tribal community. While the HPO has done a considerable amount of work to articulate its sovereignty-based approach to historic preservation, when we, began, when we began working together, the office still lacked a historic preservation plan that integrates, that articulates rather, how to integrate archaeology within its work on reservation. Given my experience developing sovereignty-based low-impact archaeological methodologies with tribal nations in California, Grand Ron approached me to work alongside them to develop a similarly oriented approach for doing archaeology in a Grand Ronde way. Now, a Grand Ron archaeology first and foremost creates knowledge with through its community-based participatory research protocol. Both Sonia Adelaide's and Chip Colwell's assessments of the collaborative continuum in archaeology make a useful distinction between collaboration as mere involvement versus community-based collaboration. Whereas the former is characterized by, by colonial, i.e. archaeologist control over the research practice and outcomes, community-based participatory research inscribes a community's decision-making authority and control over the entirety of the research process. And this distinction is important as critiques of collaborative or community archaeology note how appeals to ethical accountability often obscure deep reflections on and assessments of how power and authority are manifested within archaeological practice. Craig Chippewa and James Quinn refer to this as the problem of, quote, the traditional wolf in collaborative sheep's clothing, unquote. I argue that indigenous community-based archaeologies like FMI, FMIA do, in fact, establish a framework for collaborative practice that is participatory and equitable. 
While it's outside the scope of today's lecture to examine each element of the FMIA research protocol, which you see here on the slide, and I'm happy to return to this again in the Q&A if you have questions, I want to emphasize how the process of creating knowledge with Grand Ronde inscribes their decision-making authority at each, stage of the at each stage of research, from approval of research to deciding the appropriate venues for sharing project outcomes. Furthermore, the guidelines you see here address what participatory practice looks like for the HPO, for tribal members, and for research partners. In so doing, this protocol reframes research as a tribally led and co-investigatory process, the goal of which is two-pronged, to integrate community needs and knowledge into all aspects of work and to produce work that ultimately benefits the community. These features in turn foster community and partner relations that are grounded in the values of respect, trust, reciprocity, and importantly, equity. Now, given the fractious nature of our discipline's relationship with Indigenous peoples, fostering these values is itself a laudable goal. But approaching research as a social relationship, I think, achieves something more. It establishes a basis from which partners can examine the intersections and also divergences between archaeological and Indigenous ways of knowing. Now, borrowing from philosopher Linda Alcoff's work, such epistemic diversification, the ability to work with and across multiple ways of producing knowledge, expands our ability to holistically pose and answer questions. What's transformative in community-based research is that Indigenous ways of knowing and bodies of experience frame the research process itself and thus directly inform how we recognize evidence as such, as well as the methods used to gather, work with, and interpret that data. For example, in my work with Grand Ron, engaging with Econom encourages us to think about the relationality of Grand Ron's communities to their homelands from time immemorial to the present. And knowledge of these relations between people, places, and practices. This is a phrase that's oft repeated by HPO staff, staff so much more that it's kind of FMIA's unofficial motto, if you will. This in turn frames how FMIA works with Grand Ron's heritage. And it's from this starting point that we begin to integrate other knowledge resources, from the historical record to data recovered via archaeological or environmental techniques, to create holistic understandings of Grand Ronde's history and heritage. Now, these engagements approach Grand Ronde heritage and knowledge on its own terms, rather than seeing that knowledge as a data set that we can mine to interpret archaeological sites. This is an important point, one that relates to Western science's applications of indigenous knowledge and importantly, what we imagine the specific benefits of collaboration to actually be. Now, as Western science rushes to integrate indigenous knowledge, collaboration is often framed in instrumentalist terms. Popular science articles about, for example, ancient DNA research helping to resolve understandings of the movement of peoples, or the use of traditional ecological knowledge being applied to manage lands, or reduce fire risk, for example, in Western US and specifically California. These often frame establishing collaborative relationships as the primary hurdle standing in the way of scientific pro progress. I and my collaborators ask here and help elsewhere, how does collaboration change the science itself beyond just getting access to indigenous knowledge and data? Are we looking for indigenous communities and peoples to simply sign off on our projects? Or is the goal of collaboration to enter into a research partnership in which the objectives and methods are collectively established? In other words, for whose sake do we do this work? Now, FMIA's work to create a low-impact archaeological methodology, in fact, demonstrates how integrating community concerns and, indig and indigenous knowledge transforms how we do archaeology on the ground. And this is what I want to focus in on in this next, next segment of the talk. And I'm going to, I argue that it does so in ways that improves our, that is science's, ability to care for the past in meaningful ways. Now, using archaeology as a tool to manage Grand Ronde heritage raises significant concerns in community. Namely, the community connects physical disturbance of ancestral sites and belongings to negative health impacts. 
And the primary way that we minimize potential to create harm is to integrate Grand Ron cultural protocols into our personal practices. And again, I'd love to talk more about this during our Q&A, but I want to focus on the second aspect of how we minimize harm. And that is minimizing harm by minimizing our disturbance of the earth through the application of our low impact archeological methodology, which you see here kind of broadly outlined on the slide. Many of the methods that we employ in this methodology are increasingly common in academic archaeology and especially so in the work that's being undertaken by tribal archaeology and cultural resource programs right now. But it would be a mistake here to only envision how such minimally or non-invasive methods may facilitate collaboration with tribal nations without also considering how such collaboration contributes to the further refinement of these methods in the field. In my experience as co-director of three community-based research projects, collaborative thinking with tribal heritage managers has resulted in creative and rigorous assessments of archaeological methods and methodology. Specifically, these collaborations inspired the development of the Catch and Release Surface Collection Strategy an intensive site survey and surface collection method that provides for in-field curation of belongings back into their original provenience units after in-lab analysis and digital documentation. My long-term study of catch and release at Fort Ross State Historic Park with the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians and now on the Grand Ronde Reservation shows the great utility of this method. First, infield curation is viewed as highly beneficial by the nations that I've been working with, including the Kashaya with whom I initially developed this method with, and now with Grand Ronde. Both of them view, similarly view the permanent removal of belongings as directly connected to negative health impacts. Second, from an archeological and museological perspective, we face a collections crisis that is compounded both by current approaches to cultural resource management and the continued emphasis in academic archeology span on collection of new data rather than re-examination of legacy data. This is particularly true of surface collected finds. Even though they're considered critical for early stage field work, rarely are these belongings analyzed beyond basic sorting and even rarer yet are they re-examined after their initial collection. Through catch and release, however, we ensure that these finds are fully analyzed and that all related data is curated prior to replacing these belongings back in their original locations. Finally, the collection method presents minimal to no impacts to the integrity of in situ deposits from either collection or reburial of belongings. This is due both to the local site formation processes, we're dealing with highly active soils in, on the Grand Run Reservation, as well as at Fort Ross State Historic Park, as well as the surface collection method itself, which only recovers belongings from the root mat, which extends in these locations only zero to 10 centimeters below the ground surface that the Kashaya and Grand Ronde nations, as well as other tribal historic preservation offices and heritage managers have adopted this method indicates catch and releases wider viability as a sustainable survey method within heritage managers toolkits. Furthermore, the trainings and visits FMIA and the Grand Ronde HPO host for regional partners is leading to the adoption of not only this method, but our low impact methodology within Grand Ronde's ancestral territories. I'd like to transition now in the final portion of my talk to examine in closer detail how I and my team use this methodology I just discussed to both unsettle the process of archaeological storytelling and add a material dimension to the story of Grand Ronde survivance. Gerald Visner, an Anishinaabe journalist, scholar, and storyteller, presents acts of survivance as continuations of Native stories, as channels through which Native presence is brought into the world. Visner also cast survivance as, quote, a narrative resistance to absence, literary tragedy, nihility, and victimry. In this framing, survivance isn't just something that happened. It's a literary device for unsettling settler colonial narratives. Specifically, in his own poetry and stories, he uses the tradition of Native storytelling, and specifically irony, to disrupt terminal narratives about, quote, unquote, vanishing Indians. And he does this by connecting past events to their lived reality in the present. 
Framed thusly, indigenous peoples are not simply passive reactors to colonial violence and oppression, but they are the narrators of their own experience from the past into the present and the future. At Grand Ronde, we've approached doing archaeology and reservation as a process for reawakening stories of survivance so that they may be remembered, retold, and re-experienced by community members. As archaeologists who are not tribally enrolled nor affiliated with the Grand Ronde community, it is not the role of this project to assume the role of narrators. Rather, we approach our work as a form of active witnessing that begins with a key knowing. Grand Ronde survivance exists without our intervention. Now, indigenous critiques of archaeology emphasize how the use of almost exclusively archaeological data and deprivileging of indigenous histories as legitimate sources of knowledge reproduce asymmetrical colonial relations. In positioning ourselves as active witnesses, as active listeners, and in developing and using a grand round way for doing archaeology, we seek to specifically challenge these relations of practice by reasserting the sovereignty of the nation to curate and to tell its histories. Framed in this way, archaeology may, may enable Native communities to enhance existing bodies of historical knowledge and by engaging directly with the materially and temporally durable aspects of the archaeological record, access memories that may have lain dormant or been intentionally silenced as a result of settler colonial violence. Survivance also forces archaeologists to understand how the past is implicated in the current settler colonial moment. Colonialism is not just something that has happened in the past. It continues to inform the daily lives and political futures of Indigenous nations today. Connecting Indigenous histories from time immemorial to the present encourages a wider understanding of the multiple and intersecting ways that archaeology is connected to Grand Ronde's effort to care for and protect tribal heritage now and into the future. At Grand Ronde, remembering stories, remembering survivance through archaeology involves identifying the material dimensions related to how the nation's multiple communities, Umpqua, Malala, Rogue River, Kalapuya, and Chasta, formed a distinctly Grand Ronde sense of place and community following their forced removal to the Grand Ronde Reservation. In partnership with the Grand Ronde HPO, Field Methods in Indigenous Archaeology undertook archaeological research at two historic properties on the reservation, the Uxiat Powwow Grounds and the Grand Ron Agency School. Both of these studies were carried out in conjunction with our six-week residential field school, which I've co-directed since the summer of 2015. Our study at the Uxiat Powwow Grounds focused on the evaluation of land use and ownership on the reservation from the late 1850s until the allotment period of the 1920s. This is a project that Dr. Ian Kretzler and I completed as part of his dissertation research. The investigation of the Grand Ron Agency School, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in detail, is part of a long-term investigation of experiences of schooling and what it has meant to grow up Grand Ronde. I've carried out this latter project with the assistance of Dr. Eve Dewan, who just finished her dissertation at Brown University. The Grand Ron Agency School was one of at least five that were located on the reservation. It was operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs as a day slash boarding school from the 1890s until termination in 1954. Subsequent to the school's closure, the schoolhouse building and property served as a space for religious and cultural community events until it was demolished in early 2015 due to its deteriorated structural integrity. Like many other Indian boarding schools, children at the school were trained in a variety of occupations that reflected the school's quote unquote civilizing mission here. We're talking about blacksmithing, sewing, farming, housekeeping, not reading or writing. Even so, the agency school is remembered fondly by community members, because at various points in its history, including in its latter years, tribal members served as educators and as administrators. This experience stands in stark contrast to those associated with other schools, such as the Chamawa Indian School, the regional boarding school located in, uh, just outside of Salem, Oregon, which Grand Ronde children also attended, or even the St. Michael's Catholic Boarding School, the focus of Dr. Dewan's research, which was located directly across the street from the agency school. 
and witnessing the story of the Grand Ronde Agency School at a moment when the atrocities of Indi Indian boarding schools in the US and Canada are finally being publicly acknowledged offers a moment for pause and reflection. In telling the good stories associated with the agency school, this project does not want to supersede the other important and necessary stories to tell about the range about Indian boarding schools as a whole. This moment requires FMIA and the HPO's sensitivity to the range of perspectives within community at Grand Ronde, as well as our flexibility to perhaps alter our planned outcomes so they are consistent with the changed needs of community. As surveys of former school sites and the genocidal atrocities associated with them continue to be discussed by international media, Indigenous nations have experienced a rush of non-Indigenous outsiders offering their services alongside media requests for public comment. Indigenous scholars actively engaged in this work, such as Keisha Supernant, Christopher Horsethief, Diane Tiemann, and Marsha Small have made clear Absolute care is needed to protect survivors and community members from being re-traumatized by helicopter style research and reporting. As a non-native scholar who works with and for a tribal nation to provide material detail to indigenous histories and experiences of colonialism, I'm acutely aware that the harms created by extractive research extend beyond ensuring that indigenous nations have full control and authority over such sensitive research. In fact, there's an active tradition of forcing and only believing Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized voices when they, quote, only speak their pain. Here I draw inspiration from Bell Hooks' understanding of the margins as sites of resistance to challenge archaeologies of colonialism, to resist reifying settler colonial narratives that subsume Indigenous experiences to the tropes of tragedy and absence. This is not to deny the violence of colonialism or the reality of indigenous genocide. Both of these things are true, but rather to only remember these aspects, to make them the only authentic story told about indigenous peoples and their experiences denies indigenous peoples their continued creative survivance. How then can we tell even the difficult stories in a good way, in a way that speaks to the margin as a site of resistance and not one of despair? Considering that field methods in indigenous archeology span was planned as a long-term partnership, the Historic Preservation Office and I found, felt strongly that our work to remember Grand Ronde survivance begin in a good way by centering stories of hope, pride, joy, and belonging because the history of the Grand Run Reservation and the stories attached to the agency school tell not only of community resistance and survival, but of community success and celebration in fashioning a new sense of belonging, home and connection in a place to design to advance the settler colonial project. While there's some continued skepticism expressed within the, within the Grand Ronde community regarding the cultural appropriateness of unearthing belongings, there has also been consensus among tribal, among tribal members that there is value in remembering history through archaeology. As we've begun to initiate oral history interviews with elders, fragments from the past that we've recovered from the schoolhouse privy, metal hair barrettes faceted to look like they were rubies, Beeman's chewing gum wrappers, child-sized pairs of scissors, still sharpened pencils worn down until they were but nubs, slivers of chalk, and even still vibrant pages of 1930s era comic books have ignited discussions and dialogue in community about what it was like to grow up Grand Ronde. Certainly without these tools, the community would still remember, but the tactile sense of history encapsulated in these belongings elicits strong emotional and memory triggers that have led elders and community members to share with us. It's important to note that remembering is also difficult. The current generation of elders were children when their nation was terminated, and many of their families resettled onto other reservations or in nearby cities until the tribe's reservation lands were restored in 1988. The Historic Preservation Office and I have been struck by the willingness of community to work with FMIA, from sharing their stories, to visiting the project on site, 
to directly participating in the training program as students. We believe that it's ultimately the fact that we practice archaeology in a grand round way, that we've created a mutual, that we've created a culturally appropriate and respectful process for sharing tribal history, that this is what's facilitated community members' desire to collectively remember the traumas of the past alongside the fuller spectrum of what coming to live in community at Grand Ronde has meant. As I wrap up, I want to highlight three major impacts of the work that I just described. First, the real value of catch and release and the FMIA low impact methodology is that it calls on heritage managers to rethink what it means to work with and care for tribal heritage. In coming to see Grand Ronde's ancestral places as inextricably connected to people and practices today, we are placed in relation to these belongings. This results in a fundamental shift in how we see and interact with tribal heritage. They go from being resources that we extract to objectively to, or objectively study to non-human relations that are owed our respect and remain living parts of community today. What might we achieve in witnessing the past via the small traces people left be, have left behind and in conversation with the living? And how might such dialogue, engaged practice, and emplacement of people, places, and practices move us towards greater equity and justice in archaeology and beyond? Second, oral and documentary Indigenous histories, particularly those surrounding traumatic events such as removals and schooling, often contain silences born out of state indifference and community attempts to place these experiences in the past. Yet as Maori scholar Linda Tuhiwai Smith reminds us, remembering can be a first step in a process of healing and transformation. FMIA and the Grand Run HPO believe that archeology span has a real role to play in addressing such silences in, in, in indigenous history when such work is directed by communities themselves and where they have full authority to tell their stories. Our shared goal is to mobilize the knowledge remembered and witnessed through FMIA by putting it back into community today. Finally, while I didn't discuss the FMIA field school, it is an integral part of the work that I've just described. As Chip Colwell recently noted, collaboration represents a fundamental um, change in the mindset of archaeologists, one I believe that's dependent on and best supported by educational and training opportunities like field methods in Indigenous archaeology. While not all of our 40 graduates will continue on in archaeology, they carry with them specific understandings of tribal sovereignty and a personal awareness of the wide ranging ethical and social and legal impacts of scientific research within Indigenous nations. These are important lessons, not just for future archaeologists, but for all of us who live in settler states and occupy Indigenous lands today. The process of building relationships alters who we are as archaeologists and as people, and we cannot return to a point in which we did not possess the insights that flow from these relationships. As Thomas King explains, don't say in the years to come that you would have lived your life different if only you had heard this story. You've heard it now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez, for that super interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, I remember I'm already thinking about so many things that I would like to implement on our project in Yucatan. Um, so I'd like to reiterate uh, Sarah Smith's call in the chat that if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the specific Q&A tab. Um, we have one question in there already, so that'll get us started. Uh, so Tony would like to know, what are the implications of NAGPRA catch and release and the FMIA for the roles, purposes, and future of museums? That's a big question. <laughs> First off, I do wanna I do wanna point out that um, FMIA has purposefully chosen properties and questions that ensure that we do not impact any ancestors' remains or any places that are of extreme. Um, um, concern to the community. So all of the places that we've been working on have been chosen with reference to, um, to the needs to protect certain spaces and to not disturb them. 
Um, in terms of the catch and release, certainly what we're advocating for here is taking a broader understanding of what it means to curate and care for tribal belongings um, and to ensure that the collections that we make as archaeologists don't go into what Reno Franklin, the tribal historic preservation officer from the Kashaya Band of Puma Indians, who we worked very closely with in developing this method, he talked about um, these collections, uh, the, the generation of these collections as them going into the black hole, never to return home. So certainly catch and release is a part of trying to make amends for that process and to ensure that belongings are cared for in both culturally appropriate ways and ways that ensure their future kind of survival and caretaking. So that's kind of a little bit behind the scenes, although oftentimes in our work with heritage managers, non-tribal heritage managers, we really emphasize kind of the wider benefits of curation within place, especially for um, surface collected finds. Like I said in the talk, almost nobody returns to these to analyze them. Everybody collects them. You spend a lot of time doing this and nobody is actually fully analyzing them or cataloging them or even returning to them. So what What's the value for us to hold on to these things? Um, in terms of the future of museums, certainly Grand Ronde itself, they have opened their own um, tribal repository. They are it, taking in new collections. They are transferring collections. They are also working with a wide number of museums throughout the world, including the British Museum, in order to do long-term and other short-term loans to bring back those belongings and the knowledge held within them into community. Thank you. Uh, the next question that came in is also something that I was wondering as well. Uh, uh, Tiffany would like to know, where can we find more info about the FMIA field school? And I was wondering how you go about setting up the field school in the first place and making sure that all the students that are participating are really ready to go. It's a lot of logistics. So that first question, Tiffany, um, you can find out a little bit more about the field school via our Facebook page. So we do have a Facebook page. I can pull it up here in a second and put it into the chat. Um, we, due to COVID, we've kind of taken a pause for the field, pro, pro, um, field aspect of FMIA, and we've been really focused upon doing lab analysis. So majority of our work right now has been a lab-based field training program. And then my other current graduate student, Yoli Ngandali at the University of Washington has been working with the Historic Preservation Office and broader culture department, as well as the tribe's artists, in order to document and um, to document ground stone um, and engraved rock belongings found within the Columbia River. So we've really tried, we're kind of at the end of doing kind of excavations related with the schoolhouse and with the powwow grounds, and we're turning our attention to some other new additional questions that the community has. Certainly, as soon as we decide to do another field training program, we will announce it within the Facebook page. I'm Thank also you. yeah. yeah. Uh, next question coming in from Francis. Um, can you speak to other examples or variations you have knowledge of with other American Indian or Alaska Native tribes? I think related to the Grand Ronde Way. Um, just curious. Yeah. Well, the reason why we call indigenous archaeologies and we use the plural form of it is that because each indigenous each indigenous archaeology is designed specifically um, in reference to the specific needs, um, values, and cultural protocols of the nations that we're working with. While there's kind of like broad characteristics, those broad characteristics that I outlined, we recognize tribal sovereignty, that there's direct and equitable participation of indigenous peoples, and that indigenous knowledge is used to structure the entirety of the research process. Um, there's a lot locally differences and like how what kinds of methods we might use on the ground, those things might change. So, you know, for Grand Ronde, the community and the community here is both the Historic Preservation Office, which has the governmental kind of authority to manage and care for tribal cultural resources on and off reservation. But there's also the general community of tribal members that are enrolled at Grand Ronde. And you can imagine that perspectives vary within that, but the Historic Preservation Office 
and the culture committee who helps advise them on making these decisions. They see excavations, for example, and our archaeology as being not antithetical to their needs and or their perspectives. That said, there's many other nations. Um, I'm thinking of several of like the Pueblo communities in the Southwest, for example, and the work that June Sinceri does. I'm forgetting the specific Pueblo's name that he works with, a faculty member at UC Berkeley. Um, they have kind of a uh, moratorium on doing any kind of ground disturbances. So those kinds of things can certainly change depending upon the community that you're working with. But indigenous archaeologies more broadly kind of share the same flavor profiles, if you will, if you think about it in terms of recipes. We've got, you know, different, we have kind of standard flavor profiles, but the ingredients shift based upon the community that you're working with. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think you actually went over this a little bit more at, at the beginning of the Q&A, uh, but Ian is asking for a little more clarification about the catch and release process and how that benefits uh, everyone involved mm -hmm. in the investigation. Yeah. So this gets into like a deep dive of really nerdy archaeological methods. <laughs> So most often, surface collection and or survey methods were designed in contexts where, you know, you're working in a desert context where you have very good surface visibility for any belongings that are on the, on the surface. If you've ever been to Northern California and the coast, Fort Ross is directly, like, it's on the coast. So Grand Ronde is not on the coast, but similar kinds of coastal environments there is no ground surface because everything is covered with plants, like really dense vegetation and root map. And so in designing a method to try to, to try to figure out exactly what kinds, like what kinds of belongings exist within a site to try to narrow down exactly how large a site is or what its potential occupation history is. Um, we decided that we would have to disturb the ground in some ways in order to in order to do um, in order to collect a representative sample of belongings from the sites that we're working at. Um, Typically, the traditional methods that we would use for that would be something like a shovel test probe, an STP. These are really common kinds of things. They are fairly destructive. You know, you're talking about a 25 by 25 or 50 by 50 centimeter hole placed systematically in a line and, you know, or in a grid pattern across a site. That's fairly invasive. Instead, what we decided is to literally um, you know, we set up our site grid and within each of our survey blocks, usually five by five meter blocks, we select randomly one one by one meter unit in order to peel back the sod. Literally, we like peel it back, collect artifacts within that root mat. It's within that top layer of the site. We bring those artifacts, those belongings back to the lab. We analyze them. We um, um, we, we catalog them, and then after our field investigations are done, we return them to their original one by one meter unit proveniences. So the value of catch and release in this sense is that we are able to be able to characterize, you know, how old a site is potentially based upon what kinds of belongings are represented, what kinds of belongings are represented and coming back up to that surface area. Um, we are also able to ensure that should we want to return to a site, for example, and this was really important in working with Kashaya, as we were in the process of creating um, a digital and physical interpretive trail that directly highlights Kashaya's ancestral sites for the general public. This is a trail that's actually in the process of being built now at Fort Ross. Some I, We started the project in 2004, and it's almost like 20 years later. Gives you a scale, time scale of which we're working with with these projects. Um, it's really important that we're able to document what the impact of interpreting those sites for the public is upon those ancestral places themselves. So actually this method of surface collection is such that we can go back to those sites, for example, in five years or 10 years, or even a year down the road to try to see whether or not um, we can catch those same belongings, whether or not they've moved across the site. We can begin to answer even more questions about site formation processes. Like we always imagine the ground under our feet as being very stable, like it's firm, unless it's earthquakes. Like we usually think it's like very stable, very firm. And yet at Fort Ross, when we first began our work there, um, we had imagined maybe, you know, soil turnover we knew was active, but maybe accumulation would only be like a centimeter or two centimeters over a long period of time. And indeed what we found between initial collecting of, um, of Kashaya belongings to their reburial, this is about a five year period, we had soil accumulation of over 10 centimeters. 
that is so much bigger than we had ever imagined that those soils are moving. That's a lot of movement. So this technique is great for both the tribal concerns and perspectives of ensuring that belongings don't go into the black hole of curation. And it's also an, a new technique for us to be able to um, continue to monitor um, the impact to archaeological sites to better understand how these places are being eroded and or changed throughout time. I hope that answered your question, Ian. Thank you. Yes, uh, catch and release is such an interesting idea to incorporate because we're running into those curation issues where I work, for sure. And sometimes I hear that it's being solved by reburying item or objects that were taken in for curation, but not in the location where they were originally gathered. So it is just not the right way to do it, obviously. Um, Another question just came in. Um, do you see any equivalent methods of the catch and release method in any of the state or federal agency lands you're familiar with, such as park service, forest service, et cetera? And usually this works on kind of like a park by park or agency by agency, actually regional office location. In our case, um, with the catch and release at Fort Ross, we're working directly with the California Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, we also have used, and we here, I'm talking about my former advisor and I, Kent Lightfoot, who worked on the Kashaya Poma Interpretive Trail Project, and then also worked on the Pinnacles um, National Monument Archaeology Project with the Amamutsun Band of Ohlone. And both of those parks, we were able to use this method. Now at Grand Ronde, we are introducing it. Um, and I don't have on hand the, the other TIPOs and other agencies that have started to do it. You kind of, you don't necessarily, you give these presentations and you don't know how they're going to be integrated. Um, and so you hear kind of sporadically through the years, oh yeah, people are using this. There is one important character or difference here that I would talk about because there are some people who do, um, another way that people talk about this is curation in place, but most often those methods rely upon people in the field doing the analysis. We do not do that. And we do that for a very important reason. That is often the people who are doing the field surveys and the field collection are not trained in specific material analysis techniques. So for example, at um, Fort Ross and working with Kashaya belongings, we did a range of lithic and debitage analyses that you just cannot do in a field context. It also ensured that we had highly trained individuals working on the, with these materials that um, you know, that's an added layer of security that we wanted to ensure to make sure to ensure that we're doing this work appropriately and we're getting as much information from these belongings as possible, again, to justify it to the agencies, because the biggest kind of concern that people have is that people will not do their due diligence within specifically within cultural resource management. That if you use this technique, it's a way to cut corners. We're not advocating for cutting corners. We're advocating for rethinking what's possible when we're working across archaeological and, ind and indigenous perspectives. So we can get the same amount and actually more information than other than we would um, otherwise be able to using other um, collection methods. Hey, you really raised a lot of excitement with the catch and release method. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I should say we also developed it, you know, working with with Reno and with Walter and Walt Antone, Walter Antone, and um, some other Kashai elders, like everybody fishes. And we were just chatting about it. And I had joked, you know, what if we just call this catch and release? Everybody started laughing. We're like, that is the name. <laughs> it makes so much sense. It's perfect. Um, Scott wants to know, uh, is release absolute or does the tribe get to decide whether to return it or have it in their own museum, for instance? Yeah, Scott, I could certainly see whether, like, again, this would be depending upon what nation you're working with, what they would want to have happen. In the case of Kashaya and Grand Ron, they both want those, those belongings re, um, reburied and placed within their original one by one meter provenience units. Certainly that's something we've discussed with other TIPOs, especially here locally in Washington state and in Oregon, we've been doing a lot of outreach with them, talking about the method, what it looks like. And some communities have expressed, well, you know, could we just, you know, we might feel more comfortable having them curated because this is a heavily visited place, for example, and it might encourage looting and whatnot. Um, we don't think that that's really the case because I mean, we've, we've returned to these sites and you really can't see any of the impact um, from our activities. 
Um, no, thank is, you, there value, sorry, is there value in uh, 3D scanning of the artifacts between the catch and release phases, such as some types of study that do not require excavating them back up? And Terry wants to ask about that. Definitely, Terry. And that's actually Yoli Ngondali's work that I talked about, my graduate student. That's exactly what she's doing. She's using a range of 3D photogrammetry um, and multispectral imaging in order to digitally document um, ground, stone, and rock art belongings. We're going to be using those same techniques in order to, to doc in order to document the belongings that we have recovered from the Uxat Power Grounds, Powwow Grounds, and um, the Grand Ronde Agency School. So great for asking that questions. It's kind of like the new thing that we're doing. In the case of the work with um, Kashaya, we've also, we've done um, photography. We didn't have the ability to do photogrammetry, but certainly with the excavated belongings, um, we're in the, pro we will be starting to do that soon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez, and thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. We've come to the end of our archaeology hour. Uh, thank you all for being here, and as We've mentioned uh, Dr. Gonzalez will be speaking again to the AIA on Thursday, April 27th. So do tune in for that at 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific time for the science of storytelling. Thank you so much again, Dr. Gonzalez, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, AIA, for hosting this.